I want to start jumping in with Hook, Sir Robert Hook in 1665, looking at what he calls his most precise instrument. He wrote in Micrographia, whence we say the sharpest, we say as sharp as a needle, and putting the needle point of his compass under his new microscope. And to his, which he proclaims was to magnify it by a million fold in bulk, a slight exaggeration, it was actually just 50 fold, but still serious magnification. And to his vertiginous horror, he finds it to be not smooth and pointed, but as he wrote, broad, blunt, very irregular, marked by the crudeness and the bungling of the art. Pulling back from the kind of vertiginous horror of what he saw, he looks again at the point of his needle and finds that it is again sharp um, and indeed precise. And he comments, how much therefore can be built upon demonstrations made only by the production of the ruler and the compass? He will be better able to consider that shall but view those points and lines with the microscope. A comment that's all the more poignant when one thinks just a few years later, he, Wren and Newton will be swinging their compasses, rebuilding fire-torn London. So the arrow hook discovers on his needle, and the subject of the work that I've been doing in this book, is not the epic era of catastrophe. It's not the kind of seminal images of Tacoma Bridge and the kind of acute structural collapse. Nor is it the chronic performative failures of modernism and the kind of ambivalent legacy of some of its urbanism. Nor is it looking at the errants of syntax and the playful games of Eisenman's misreadings, Eisenman's Romeo and Juliet. Nor does it really pertain to the aesthetic errori of Vasari's artists that stray from the true path nor does it directly um, pertain to the erroneous forms of the monstrous and ways in which this pertains to the ugly. Nor does it even look at the ethical errors delineated by morality. Those we shall see, the ethical is never far behind um, the physical error, is never far behind, nor is, indeed is the monstrous nor the ugly. They cluster together. What I'm addressing then in this book here is the kind of micro and minor error in every sense that plagues all materialization. But this is not to say that such error is insignificant. The humble, almost negligible error, not unlike its ethical counterpart, always starts small, but as any theologian would argue, like heresy, if left unchecked, has an infinite capacity to expand, to grow in its effect, as perhaps, after all, this image of Tacoma Bridge does demonstrate. And it's against this symbolic threat of di that the digital dimensioning to six or nine decimal places that architects routinely do now, like the, like the sharpened pencil points before it, stand ranked. So Hooke's microscope, like Alberti's window, as we now know, were to be installed in the computer. We zoom out and the error disappears, but like Hooke, we know it's still there. So this is Sutherland's 1962, Ivan Sutherland's 1962 sketch pad that actually, when I opened my old copy of Architecture and its Image that CCA produced a long time ago now, this very still is in there. And sketch pad, for those of you who don't know, is now widely recognized as the progenitor of CAD. Place another one in there. <laughs> sort of like the picture within a picture within a picture idea. Right, it's real nightmare material. And as it gets come smaller, back. even though the spot sort of disappears, uh, it, it's really still there. Material indeed. So behind the window that the operative in this video, in this film, names perhaps for the first time, is installed a very large piece of paper. Some side, we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window. We can uh, uh, imagine the computer as a fixed sheet of paper behind this window. Its scale is approximately two miles inside. Two miles? Two miles. And you have to love the kind of hovering hand of hesitation as he's thinking, can I really call this a window with a big piece of paper behind it? That two mile big piece of paper is now 14.2 million miles on the side with the possibility of drawing to ten thousandths of an inch, no matter in precision, no matter where one draws on it. 
So the vertiginous void that Hooke felt himself falling through as he peered down through his microscope and the accuracy gap he saw opening up between its magnification and that of the naked eye is not dissimilar to that which now opens up between the digital drawing and the setting out on site in the rain, in, in the mud by different gloved hands of the walls that we draw to six decimal places. Digitalization, that is, far from rationalizing architecture's economies of precision, has procured a whole new arena for surplus precision, a whole new arena for the kind of propagation of error, a whole, the, the possibilities of error. When Gordon Matter Clark took a jigsaw to cut a section through a suburban house in splitting, a project I'm sure you're familiar with, he was, amongst other things, as himself an architect then, already, as himself an architect, already then making a mockery of what was the immaculate drafting film and the 0.18 uh, drafting pen. So here he's cut the house in two and he's knocking out the top course of the foundation wall. He works, as this unbuilding films show, with zero margin for error, zero redundant precision, and there is no drawing because he is the drawing. That is, he's collapsed instruction operation and operation and is therefore able to incorporate error back into the central production and do what he's about to do now, which is catch the house, this, as it suddenly tips beyond expectation. The point being, this is not what architects do. The Baroque invisible architecture, or the Baroque invisible architecture of margins for error that once traced its way through the paper drawing is rendered all the more complex in computational design and now in digital fabrication. But now that we have the ability to calculate perfection using no more or less gas than to calculate approximation, which is kind of not true, approximation is actually more work, but we'll put that aside for the moment. Surely it's time to ask, what exactly does it do to the relations between the calculated or the drawn on the one hand and the materialized, digitally fabricated or conventionally on the other? Is this something that we want? Do we want this perfection? But we don't. We don't ask. The fetishization of precision in architectural culture, whilst testifying to a set of relations that are anything but transparent, also silences any critical interrogation of their inbuilt redundancy. And it is at that curious cathexis of the surfaces of architectural representation and the representation of architectural surfaces that we find the fetishization of precision most heightened. Take the architectural render, for instance. What internal resolution does this top dressing of Newtonian optics why is it, what is it working so hard to conceal? Any interrogation, like the optics that the kind of rendering algorithm mimics, effectively bounces off. And one has to ask, what does it say about the insecurities of architecture's productive culture that when we get hold of the incredible compute computational power, we use it to produce very shiny drawings. And I chose this very shiny drawing from all the very shiny drawings out there because this one is so shiny it's almost wet. And if it's not wet, it's certainly kind of meant to be understood as somehow slippery. So saturated is its resolution, it positively drips precision. Indeed, we might even argue that this surface excess of redundant precision is the ornament of today. Which is to say, what I've been trying to do with this book, what I'm trying to do with this book, is to invite the architectural reader to think precisely about precision. But this neat formulation fails, fails on two counts. Firstly, it assumes both a lack of ambiguity to the term precision, a lack of ambiguity precision simply does not possess. It's actually a highly ambiguous, a highly imprecise term. And secondly, because it fails to take into account the fact that the architect's relations to precision are already congenitally imprecise. But there is, an, of course, another layer to the threat physical error has always constituted, and its origins are to be found in Aristotle's metaphysics and in Aristotle's conflation of error, always with matter and never with form. So here we have the Cohen brothers at their very best with their Aristotelian wood chipper busy deleting form from some poor chap's leg, and the form, um, the, the, the form of the leg is rendered back into materiality and ultimately back into matter sprayed on the snow. Meanwhile, Marg, the formidable pregnant cop you're about to see under her Minnesota regulation winter wear, is of course busy doing the opposite, that is busy rendering matter into form. So 
Cohen brothers know their Aristotle. Error emerges as both an a possible agent of matter and curiously its only physical formal register. It then follows that any elaboration of error as an active category in architecture can potentially access that most evasive category, matter itself, while avoiding some of the traps of fetishization that so plagued the 20th century. But this also means that physical error embodies everything Aristotelian matter stands for, a complex intersection of indeterminacy, difference, existence, matter lends existence, interiority, process, and entropy. Literally, when things go wrong, it's because of a privation of form in Aristotelian terms, it's because of matter. It follows also that any elaboration of error as a category is necessarily a critique of the interests precision is in service to. That is, the question of error is always unavoidably political. Aristotle's schema installs the questions we still do not ask, can something be too precise, for instance, the properties we still fear, and the degenerate other that we still, while keeping carefully hidden, conversely use to define what we are and what we do as architects. But, as architects, we have also developed precocious tools for managing our unique fear of physical error. Margins for error, tolerance, material thra failure thresholds, stands and specifications, and so on. But behind these kind of methodological fortifications, and here we see all the kind of scientific testing going on behind them, lie the more systemic defenses embedded in architectural culture. The metaphoricity we kind of so casually trade in, the use of inference and sloppy science, the, strate the strategic ideological colonization of the vacuum's technical indeterminacy leaves but never quite fully declares. And of course, the many epistemic models we employ in our accounting of form. Just as when artists talk about their work, we learn not so much about their work, but about the delusions under which they work. When as architects, we talk about how precise a drawing is, how precise the material system is, something we kind of automatically, compulsively do, all the more so in education. We betray, like Foucault's unwitting subject, that words had kept their meaning, that desire still pointed in a single direction, and that ideas retain their logic. But the logic that we assume organizes the relations between precision and its control of material error in architectural culture and production have long since unraveled. Precision quite simply no longer does what it says in the tin. Its desires are now on a kind of altogether different course from their stated purpose. So with the, with the work in this book, I'm arguing that the architect's very special fear of error has constituted, and indeed now still constitutes, a powerful undertow in all of our relations that govern the process, all of our relations to the process of materialization. That is to say, the brick wall once drawn with precisely judged approximation, and now drawn, say, at six decimal places or more, has become a methodological absurdity that nonetheless strangely doesn't seem to embarrass us. You know, quite the contrary, we kind of almost exult in its redundant exactitude. But how then are we to understand the function of this redundant exactitude, or the function of redundant precision in architecture? This is Conrad Vashman's extraordinary um, drawings and all the more so his photographs of nestled components which in so many ways prefigure the imagery that's come out of parametricization. So Conrad Vashman, whilst pursuing pre-digital precision beyond the limits of constructability, also claimed to be stripping architecture of all redundancy, but clearly redundant precision didn't kind of count within his equations. Which begs the question then, it is there to do what exactly? How much of it is about some other undeclared imperative that is not only driving the fetishization of the apparently precise in architectural practice, but also the reverse engineering in the construction of the terms materiality or tolerance that are kind of so key to the way we work. The convoluted relations the architect architecture maintains with precision can only, in a sense, be understood as attesting to the complex hold the fear of error has over its cultures. Like Hook, if we now zoom into our current generation of scopes, well, that was current when I chose the slide, it's probably not current any longer, um, we find that things do not join up quite as smoothly as we thought they did. In the last hundred odd years, a no man's land has opened up between precision and material error, error control. And in my attempting to navigate this shifting landscape within the 20th century, um, I've... Um, the, the 
through the writing, through the research, what I've been trying to do is to kind of map the unraveling of this logic, of a logic upon which so much once hung. Indeed, the rise of precision, like a ghost, can be understood to shadow the dominant narratives that stitch together the removal of ornament at one end of the century to digital fabrication directed by a network at the other. What these narratives don't tell us is that precision and error relations were fundamentally transformed through each of modernism's seminal crises. So what if we were to add as a kind of thought experiment of sorts to the familiar litany of historiographic formulae that govern our relations to what we called modernism, and we know them all, materials got more honest, ornament was removed, solid became ephemeral, closed planned opened, linearity delivered the uniformity of mass production, and we can even stretch it to construction was eclipsed by automation, as concept gave way to regulatory network and so on, what if we were to add to those or perhaps substitute them with, quite simply, things just got more and more precise? Or better still, with the more we cornered error, the more we feared it. We might find that in Wittgenstein's house, where Loos's sublimated ornament resurfaces as a new kind of manifestation of excess, one of surplus precision, a precocious encounter in its indexical surfaces between the singular exactitude of the 18th century precision, that is the exactitude of Hooke's needle, meets that of, meets the kind of prefiguration of the precision of digital differentiality, the precision of the mass customization that surrounds us today. We might find, too, that the rejection of organic materials did not just produce the steel and glass experiments of Sharrow and Mies that we know so well, but a whole generation of aircraft whose newly shiny metal wings meant they were quite simply too heavy to ever take off, as they sacrificed all punk functional logics in their pursuit of predictability, predictability being um, meshed, joined at the hip to precision at that point, still is. And that the reorganize we might equally find that the reorganization of precision and error around the liquid intelligence of reinforced concrete and the automated construction and instantaneous architectures it promised not only triggered kind of frenzied invention of standards and specifications, but also erected the kind of rhetorical infrastructure of the even more instantaneous and this even more immaculate form finding some hundred years later that we now know as parametricization. Indeed, the flow of slurry and Le Corbusier's house that can be poured in three days and all the passive language that that invokes in many ways can be understood to have paved the way for the flow of data that followed and the peculiar abdication of authorship that parametricization has procured. So now that the disciplining actions once held within the mechanics of concept are rehoused within the rubric of the regulatory network, what then are the fears and anxieties we might have inadvertently installed in our current use of the computer? Which is not to argue some kind of Luddite position, quite the contrary, but to argue for a critical interrogation of the ways in which we've chosen to develop the hallucinatory capacity for precision the computer so glibly lays at our feet, whichever paradigm employed. As we trade causal linearity for more systematized modes of production, the fear of error, like the error itself, to quote that nice chap we saw in the Lincoln Laboratories earlier with his nightmare material, although we can't see it, it's still there. How are we then to understand precision out now outside of its duty to exclude error and now potentially uncoupled from its contract with truthfulness? And more importantly, as error mutates into the next new thing we don't want, which of course is the genius of error, the next new deviation that outwits architecture's ever augmenting corrective measures, what are the new byproducts of our fear? Indeed, this architecture of anxiety is exactly what led to the metal aircraft that couldn't fly, and as early as 1967 was already harnessing the engineered neutrality that is now so central to parametric optimization by promising the error-free calculation of a democratic formal solution via the processing of desire. Already the people of one city have been polled as to their preferred living pattern for the end of the century. A computer produced this plan for a city of the future by processing the individual desires of half a million people for different types of homes, methods of transport, patterns of leisure and of work, together with the expected population growth and the resources available. 
but the computer could only offer a series of mathematical concepts. It is to the degree that we understand this powerful tool and how best to use it that we can gain the maximum possible benefit. For only men and women can ensure that this city of the future will be a place of beauty and tranquility. Well, the music says it all, does it not? But this city under its IBM pink sky is clearly unsure as to how the beauty and tranquility its men and women must ensure is to meet the arithmetical averaging of their desires and deliver this kind of vie en rose. Not surprisingly, perhaps, we find the politics of our addiction to precision more intelligently addressed in other fields in the work of various visual artists that I look at in the book, Gordon Matt Clark, as we've seen already, an obvious case, perhaps slightly less obvious is Hepworth's technical notes on how she carves her way around floors, Rachel Whiteread's abdication to the kind of liquid intelligence of casting, and Via Selman's extraordinary surfaces. But also, there's extraordinary interrogation that's already taken place, obviously, in the exact sciences and in the history of science with Nancy Cartwright's critique of the kind of use of sloppy inference and gross approximatory architecture at work in our application of fundamental laws, not least Hooke's law, very central to architects, and in the life sciences with Evelyn Fox Keller's seminal revisionist work that critiques the hijacking by metaphor and its reductive legacy, calling for more democratic ep epistemic models that allow for more multiplicitous modeling of interpretation. So in the book, I return to the set historiographic formulae I listed earlier um, as, as examples, but not via their usual narratives, but via the testimonies of what I've been calling their kind of artifactual fallout, that is, their objects that they produced that simply failed, a set of troubled and troublesome artifacts that exist kind of hidden in an ideological eclipse that lies at the material heart of modernism, a needle that was found blunt, we saw at the beginning, a window that wasn't, an airplane too heavy to fly, the jigsaw that could draw, a doll's house that defied entropy, and a corridor that led nowhere. Um, and we also saw the radiator, Wittgenstein's radiator, that was, in fact, razor sharp. But perhaps the most poignant of these, these artifactual fallout, these kind of artifactual witnesses, in a sense, is the engineered dodos of the first generation of metal aircraft, which came about with aviation engineers' full-scale adaptation of architecture's rejection of organic materials. And in architecture, we always dwell on what we import, the section from medicine and so on. It's interesting, actually, to look at what we export. It's somehow a kind of more cunning mirror to hold up to architectural culture. So during the interwar period, the symbolic conflation of flight on wood became as if overnight intolerable. And the very successful spruce and linen aircraft was rebuilt in Duralumen. So, in a sense, what exactly was it that suddenly became so repulsive to the newly modern mind that better a few generations of metal airplanes, so massive they could barely carry fuel, let alone passengers, than the continuation of planes con contaminated by things wooden? And here we have the very sad, beard more inflexible, these kind of extraordinary albatross-like wings, not soaring the skies, but pottering around a muddy field in Norfolk. And the Beardsmore had many similarly kind of afflicted cousins, engineered dodos. These engineered dodos are all the more ironic given this. How did this emblem of all that is rational become so illogical? How did it become so surreally absurd? And if you remember Verne Architecture, the pages are filled with images of airplanes. Buildings and bridges were now steel, even boats were steel, and it was destiny that planes were next in line to be reborn metallic. For one, as Le, Corbu as Le Corbusier's famous formulation puts it, not only is wood the deceitful harbor of error, literally in wood there may be lurking some treacherous snot, but Corbusier again, steel girders and more recently reinforced concrete are pure manifestations of calculations, that is, stress-strain calculations manifestations of almost pure form. The behavior of metal was, courtesy of the approximatory architecture of Hooke's law that Nancy Cartwright kind of critiques so cleverly, the behavior of metal was rendered predictable and thus curiously aligned with transparent accountability 
faithfulness, and ultimately the truth. So note how predictability delivers truthfulness, where un unpredictability necessarily delivers erroneousness, whereas there's nothing inherently truthful about being predictable. But these aircrafts that could not fly also ask difficult questions about technological instrumentalism, about how it conceals the indeterminacy latent in any material technology, and how it thus provides opportunity for ideological insertion. Wood does not lie, metal does not tell the truth, yet these planes that couldn't fly were deemed superior to the wooden ones that could because they represented a newly metallic, error-free reality. For aviation engineers accustomed to working with wood to really high, to very high safety standards with a much slimmer margin for error, being suddenly required to pull back and remain within elastic behavior, within the kind of comfort zone of metal, as it were, constituted a radical change in their relations to material precision. That is, despite the repeated protests coming up from the aviation workshop floors, it was metal with its ideological embodiment of all that is precise that fattened up the margins and implanted the first structural redundancy in the quintessential engineered artifact. Metal became almost not a material. It became calculation itself, not only that which stands for the truth via predictability, but crucially also that which is able to both explain and be explained. In bypassing the phenomenological and promising direct representation of the theoretical, Metley was then singularly able to collapse what was meant to be observable or describable, i.e. the material behavior before us, with that which by definition is never to be observed. That is the explanatory fundamental law that governs the material. Obviously, fundamental laws make no error. This metal was not only separated from all other materials, but it was almost separated from matter itself. And crucially, it was epistem epistemologically separated from error. Metal, quite simply, couldn't make a mistake. But recombining description with explanation is not without conflict. Explanatory power often comes at a price, the price usually being the truth itself. The price the metal aircraft played was flight itself. Artifacts such as these disrupt the historiographies of, the instru of instrumentalist rationalism, which still dominate our accounts of modernism. Part of the privileged epistemology of technology is, as Malke points out, that its, quote, practical effectiveness exempts it from sociological or other forms of explanation. But what then if a technology has no practical effectiveness? Is it still exempt? What do such explananda do to the explanatory enterprise of technology's delivery of scientific truthfulness? And what do they do in turn to the epistemological duties in the explanatory enterprise of the architect? Architects being, as we know, kind of pathologically hooked on explaining things. The relations between explanatory truth and truth can be understood to be typically inversely proportional. So that is, the more complex the phenomena that needs to be explained, the more the minimal the explanatory model is. But it is by definition in the nature of error to resist the reductive modeling employed in the name of precision. Conversely, we might intuit that the more reductive the explanatory model is, such as these two, the greater a fear of error in the matter to which they pertain. The central event architects are, of course, doomed to forget forever have to explain is, of course, the arrival of new form and how this is transmitted error-free into material. So I want, therefore, to use the remaining time to look at another case of architectural export of the minimal mod of its kind of minimal modeling and its surprising role in the installation of corrective power in a desire to be rid of the error of entropy, not in the giant, but in the miniature and the miniature that was ultimately to become code. Here, architecture's already precocious tools for managing its unique fear of error would redefine, as we now know, precision's relations to truthfulness. And I want to do this by looking at the intersection of two supremely unfashionable architects, but they might not be supremely unfashionable here. Um, I hope they're not, because they're actually both really interesting. The last Victorian architect, Sir Edward Lancier Lutyens, and the first, albeit unwitting, cybernetic architect, Owen Schrodinger. And for those of you who don't know, Schrodinger is the guy with the glasses in the far bottom corner, looking terribly sober and terribly uncomfortable at the display of entropy going on around him. Both were stranded strangely out of their time in the first decades of the 20th century, both engaged in projects of unparalleled colonial ambition, both of which incidentally ultimately failed. 
both struggling with entropy and its scalar relations to error. Not surprisingly, it is in the explanatory models that surround reproduction, architecture and other, that we find the fear of error and the mechanisms of its control most elaborately and most ruthlessly deployed. Any elaborate, equally, any elaboration of error in architecture must inevitably address the relations between error and entropy and the architect's kind of terminal anti-entropic duties. And nowhere has the role of entropy been more scrutinized than in the apparently entropy-free business of biological reproduction. It's precisely this that brought physicist Erwin Schrodinger with his formulation of negent, negative entropy, to the microscope. But where Hooke had found horror, the horror of error, Schrodinger found, or installed to be more precise, order immune from the error of entropy. He also installed the architect as this extraordinary quote from his What is Life lectures kind of demonstrates. So Schrodinger installs the architect quite literally in the gene, in the chromosome, or to be more precise, the architect's plan, law code, its executive power, its knowledge of construction. I, find, I still find this statement utterly breathtaking. The chromosomes are set up as being the law, its delivery and execution, instruction and process. They're also all future development. What, what architect would wish to have those powers? And, and he names them architect. Schrodinger's choice of the metaphoric architect to describe the centralized authority of the chromosome and the causal linearity it secures in his gene action theory betrayed his struggle with the assignment of the precarious transmission of a species genetic blueprint via mere matter. An anxiety he correctly identified architects happened to also share and had developed precocious strategies for managing. Only the architect, as a kind of metaphoric henchman, as opposed to, say, the orchestral conductor or the surgeon or the sculptor, would brook no ambition from matter. That is, the modern gene and its secure delivery of causal linearity is inseparable from our thinking about the modern architect and his control over erroneous production. What is life, then, the lectures that Trodinger gave in Dublin in 1944 and the book he produced by the same title, and its hero architect erected the rhetorical software of molecular biology, a megastructure that led, as we now know, by the late 20th century life sciences eclipse of life by information to the cybernetic space of all current architectural reproduction. This architect was the regulations, the stands and specifications, the drawings, the contract, the, con the construction process. It was to become the building completed, occup in occupation, and then even in demolition, as the breathtaking scope of its rhetorical ambitions scripted an extraordinary kind of cradle-to-grave biography. The gene was thus made the site of an all-encompassing and fundamental animating force, this astonishingly with no idea whatsoever about what chromosomes actually did, how gene action actually works. It was, in every sense, the black box of its day. Like Quatremer de Quincy's type that, quoting uh, L'Encyclopédie, that redresses all vicious errors, that, it redresses all vicious errors that are the inevitable result of blind routine and of successive imitation, i.e. of copying, the gene too was constructed as both law and generative engine, whose exact workings were nonetheless strategically vague. And it's interesting to remember that Tony Vidler in the 1980s, in his work on um, Katramer's type, on typology, um, uh, writing, of the wall, writing on the walls, uses the modernist gene, the still modernist gene then, to explain the nefariousness of Katramer's type back to the architect. Like all enduring epistemological narratives, then gene action as it ascended to this kind of state of unchallenged orthodoxy, as Lewontin describes it, excluded all other lines of inquiry before the questions could even be asked. And thus it remained unmoved by all contrary experimental <coughs> evidence of cellular feedback, what was then called cytoplasmic or maternal effects, that had been accumulating since the 1930s. Much like the uncorroborating test results from the workshop floors of aeronautical, con of aeronautical construction, this evidence too had been shot down by the metaphoric arsenal of gene actions, minimal model. Like the primacy of metal, the primacy of the gene was deemed somehow obvious. Only they ensured an error-free reality. 
But this rhetorical house of Schrodinger is built with what Derrida would call the logic of contamination and the contamination of logic hid a fault line deep within its architecture. As we now know, it was to be undone by difference and feedback, incidentally both dismissed as error at the time. So this fault line, a kind of curious, further curious paradox, is this fault line Schrodinger had himself unwittingly installed when he introduced the term code in that quote I showed earlier in order to account for the scale of paradox of how so little material could direct so much. That is, paradoxically, when he tried to deny a material footprint to his uber architect, he set the trap for his architect's own undoing. Schrodinger's chromosome being code, thus, and almost metalless, not entirely unlike the framing of metal we discussed earlier, possessed, as Aristotle would agree, diplomatic immunity from entropic existence. Only the architect gene has, in Schrodinger's work, words, the quoting Schrodinger here, astonishing gift of concentrating a stream of order on itself and thus escaping the decay into atomic chaos of drinking orderliness. This architect then almost doesn't need precision, but simply repels error in its kind of powerful attraction of order, as it, quoting Schrodinger again, maintains itself by sucking orderliness from its environment. So, I mean, listen to the linguistic tropes. They're hard at work. We have sucking, feeding, drinking. We eat ourselves back into order. We strip our plates not only of calories, but of organization too, of negative entropy itself. In the same few years that the splitting of developmental biology from genetics, that's phenotype from genotype, was opening up the power vacuum that Schrodinger's immaterial architecture of scale inversion would colonize, but in a kind of altogether different era, Edwin Lutyens was working on two houses. One, three quarters of a mile wide, the other, four feet wide. Both, not unlike Schrodinger's enterprise, consisted of vast projects of unparalleled imperial control. Both, as I mentioned earlier, were ultimately doomed ventures. The Viceroy's Palace on the 80-mile wide site of Imperial Delhi, a last desperate attempt to control the erratic, sprawling India and the soon-to-collapse colonial empire, was to fix a diagram of order in the belief that, as Daniel Burnham reminded Lutyens from his deathbed, a noble logical diagram, once recorded, will never die. So this diagram, too, is entropy-proof. Two diagrams by Lutyens are instructive here. The first entitled, Comparing the Viceroy's House with the Palace of Versailles and the Houses of Westminster, speaks for itself. The second, entitled, Imperial Delhi Viceroy's Lower Basement, demonstrates how this ordering is to resist entropy. Behind its thick basement walls, the Viceroy's House is a machine for converting biomass into the smooth running of an empire. And I don't know if you can read it, but those various cells list ice store, sugar, meat, dairy, bakery wood, kitchen coal, ice making, pastry room, confectionery, so there's lots of sugar, vegetable larder, and so on. You get the idea. The scurrying footfalls of Maxwell's demons echo in this vast network of kitchens and stores organizing the meeting of food with heat and food with ice, as its dinners governed, its teas and tiffins negotiated, and its luncheons quashed all dissent, each a battle in the war against the accelerated entropy of India. The split of early modern, the, of the split of early modern genetics from embryology had, not unsurprisingly, spit many other properties more normally pertinent to the domain of architecture. Form from matter, instruction from materialization, linear production from more complex modes of production, and singular author from the laboring masses. Schrodinger's miniature architecture, architect is crucially solitary, unlike, say, Maxwell's extraordinary kind of subclasses of demons. Under the auspices of this divided state, the architect was to endow genetics with two more properties peculiar to architecture. First, the kind of simultaneous embodiment of the law and its interpretation, that is the ability to both be code and paradoxically be able to decode oneself, uh, quite a clever trick. And secondly, the temporal vector driving linear execution from code into material organization, ensuring zero feedback from the said material. So thus endowed, this extraordinary minimal model extinguished any distinction between organism and instruction for the generation of the next organism. Code script, 
meant the organism is its description. Indeed, the organism is eclipsed by its description. All else is lost in the schema's lacuna. All power is to the code. Meanwhile, Lutyens, like Schrodinger, was also strangely drawn to the miniature with its possibility of higher definition and thus lower entropy, most especially when dealing with a building site, 80 mile wide building site in India, I think. Whilst Lutyens was struggling with the heat and dust and chaos of the Viceroy's construction site, he was also designing the central exhibit to the 1924 British Empire exhibition, The Queen Mary's Doll's House. Seen by an extraordinary 1.5 million people, this is a kind of exercise in miniaturization and mass media. Like Imperial Delhi, it was also built to secure order within an arena of trade and resource. This doll's house, however, unlike its Leviathan counterpart, did have a fully functioning Otis operator, elevator, extraordinarily. It also had real Chateau Lafitte in the cellars, real hot water running water in the taps, working motor cars, miniature motor cars in the garage, not to mention Rudyard Kipling and his kind of tiny cursive script in the library. They asked Virginia Woolf, she said no thanks and real HMV vinyl records that could be played on a fully operative gramophone. So you get the idea. This house is nothing like the architectural models that Luchin so loved. It is instrumental, and like Schrodinger's extraordinary miniature metaphoric immaterial architecture, the doll's house that is his gene architect, it carries within itself its own decoding, its own execution too. But Schrodinger also wasn't just building metaphoric doll's houses in Dublin. A 1943 Time magazine review of his What is Life lectures commented on Schrodinger's, quote, hobby of making tiny doll's house furniture with textiles woven on a midget Irish loom. In 1941, Desmond McNamara visits Schrodinger's somewhat unusual household. He lived in Clontarf in Dublin with his wife, his mistress, and his daughter. Um, not sure who the daughter, whose daughter the daughter was. And Desmond McNamara writes, he even showed me his tapestries, these striking little strips woven on a small loom in the pattern of mathematical formula were strangely attractive and pinned to several walls like dado. So what did these tiny woven printouts mean to Schrodinger before they became the kind of blankets and rugs and his own miniature model of domesticity, somewhat, no doubt somewhat more harmonious and ordered than his own? And this is in the house in Clontarf, that's either his wife, his mistress, or his daughter, and that is not one of his weavings, but of course, the Human Genome Project. Jacquard with his loom is here, and so is Turing with his machine. The Schrodinger did not simply make miniature things for his doll's house, but their very making must itself also be miniaturized, is very telling. Like Glutchian's doll's house, Schrodinger's too is performative with its loom, whose pattern making reflected other coded scripts that would install everything that Watson and Crick needed for their own spiraling ambitions, and ultimately for Norbert Weiner's hypothetical man to be sent down the telegraph wire. In Peter de Normanville's extraordinary 1967 film, Man and Computer, that I sh with the pink city that I showed you earlier, the imagery of miniaturized domesticity is again used to explain how a very small thing, in this case a microprocessor, can organize a very big thing, such as the designing of a city. The anthropomorphized components of the computer sit around a kind of strange pentagonal table. The man sitting at the head, who appears to be conducting the orchestra, is the control unit. Um, he's got his clock there. And the guy next to him with the glasses is the input. And he passes something to the lady with the tray, and she's memory, so it's kind of easy job. She can do that. And then she passes the card to a man with red hair who is calculation. It's a slightly more, bit more difficult job. And then he passes the card to the lady next to him, and she is output. Like a kind of dysfunctional family endlessly passing the salt back and forth, the pedantic passing of tasks through, their, through its kind of laborious, iterative steps is not only unintentionally deeply comic, but through its domestication of the apparently linear execution of order reveals a hidden recursive spatiality. Only able to do one thing at a time, the miniature people in this counting machine take no shortcuts and they never make a mistake. Indeed, they can't. 
In Foundations of Mathematics, Wittgenstein, on considering the instance of error in calculation versus that in counting in a kind of particularly poignant passage in our text full of poignant passages, he takes 25 by 12, and following what he fears may simply be a kind of strange anthropological ritual that's not necessarily going to take him to the truth, stacks them 25 over 12, 5 times 2 is 10, drop the 0, carry the 1, and so on. And it all begins to feel too uncertain, too unstable. So he turns, like the small people in the counting machine we just saw, to the childlike business of counting and draws a grid of dots. He counts row by column, and then he counts column by row. They yield the same result. He can count the commutative law into existence. All is safe from the deceit of error, or is it? While embryologists were faced with the unrivaled ambitions of Schrodinger's gene, were without the kind of metaphoric arsenal of the geneticist, they did have a material arsenal of sort not unlike that of the bemused technicians in the interwar aircraft workshops faced with the kind of metaphoric arsenal of metallization. But the mutinous phenomena embryologists observed in the cell life at the other end of their electron microscopes were dismissed by being rendered formless as error. As late as 1992, which is extraordinarily late, so the genome project is already well underway, R.C. Lewontin finds himself finally having to out the fetishization of DNA, and he writes in this kind of seminal article in the New York Review of Books, first, DNA is not self-reproducing. Second, it makes nothing. Third, organisms are not determined by it. And if that's not emphatic enough, he goes on to say, not only is DNA incapable of making copies of itself, aided or unaided, it's incapable of making anything else. So finally, you might say DNA is actually beginning to sound like an architect. In La Vie Mode d'Emploi, Perec answers Schrodinger's formal question, what is life, with the performative how, the Mode d'Emploi. Like a doll's house in more maze than one, this also only one room deep sectional elevation of, of Anse Rue Simon Crubelier, the generator of both novel structure and detail, presents the reader with an interface whose job it is, like all other interfaces, to hide the Ulipian engine under the hood. This is a literary machine shackled to a set of Hamilton algorithms, notably the Knight's Move. And Perec, I'm assuming you're kind of familiar, somewhat familiar with this extraordinary novel, but basically, um, Perec, you jump from apartment to apartment. It's set in an apartment block in Paris. And Perec uses the knight's move so that you land on each apartment once, which is actually quite a tricky um, puzzle to solve. Uh, it actually took a compu he solved he, sol he described solving it par tatotement, literally tapping. I don't need to translate French here, do I? But gropingly is the way it's translated, tapping the blind man's stick. But I mean, it, it's, prior to that, it was solved only by computers. So he ends this, um, this itinerary of the night in the epilogue, and he closing La Vie in the apartment of Serge Valen, who is lying dead on his bed, with a section sketched on a canvas beside him of, quoting Perec, a block of flats which no figure now would ever come to inhabit. This mise en abîme of diagrams within diagrams makes it clear to the reader that this is no ordinary section. This is no normal interface. It is an algorithm too, a program, and in Valen's apartment, its course is run, its script is complete. The price, the error-free calculation of those little people in the IBM, around the IBM dinner table we saw earlier, guarantee, is the same looping redundancy that Perec so brilliantly parodies in his lesser-known one-sentence novel, L'art et manière d'aborder son chef de service pour lui demander une augmentation. Uh, it should be compulsory reading. Written in 1968, the same year that Waddington renamed the DNA molecule program tape, as the computer metaphor finally, as it were, stepped into the shoes vacated by the architect metaphor. L'art then uses a basic inspired flowchart to write the punctuation-free, breathless iteration in extenso. The resultant text makes manifest an architecture of exquisite precision and Baroque redundancy. Like IBN's demons, Perec's nameless underling, who is subject to the chorus of the algorithm, the kind of if yes, then, if no, then, and so on, as he circumperambulates Bellos's artful translation of Perec's Faire le Tour de, 
the flowcharts corridors or syntactic connectors as Perret calls them, is infinitely patient, endlessly repeating the circular logic of the algorithm, exhaustive in his actions, but never, like his task, never exhausted. That is, unlike the algorithm in La Vie, Perret's flowchart in La has no solution, no instruction, stop. And at page 57, we abandon him to this Sisyphean doom. Never has the recursive legacy of Turing's machine, the kind of error eradicating one task at a time space that underpins the only apparent simultaneity of the computer's performance, been so artfully conjured than in this miniaturized solitary looping of the 1960s office plan via the corridors of anxiety. While la vie is a diagram that is sectional disguised as a building, la is quite simply a building, a 1960s office plan disguised as a diagram, a flowchart. As we follow this underling's miserable hopes and pace the planimetric vectors of his anxiety, we find that like him and like the eternal IBM salt-passing family, we too have finally ascended to the recursive boredom of the machine. We too have become Waddington's program tape. The looped line of repetition that La conjures with its attendant redundancy is, of course, the invisible dominant space of now, the space behind all the extraordinary spaces we make in and with the computer, behind the glossy renders, the rank of optimized facade components, the exquisite 3D, pa 3D digital prints, and so on. We find, quite simply, in the new black box of the algorithm, the bureaucratic loop. But just as error followed life out of the gene action pan into the cybernetic fire, so too must it follow architecture out of the causal linearity pan into the circularity of the regulated network. So I want to close with the night's 23rd move from La Vie. It lands us in Moreau's apartment where we find two objects next to each other. A red pig fetus, product of a private experiment to unseat the authority of DNA and prove the contribution of cellular feedback and reproduction. And right next to it, as directed by Perec's Grand Tableau, another algorithm, stating whom he is to quote in that apartment, Joyce's description of Bloom's dream house. But Perec installs the quote, miniaturized and materialized. It's a doll's house. It's la maison de poupée de la page 135. Replete with clocks, encyclopedia, socks, champagne bottles, and automatic telephone receivers. The counting computer in the IBM film I showed earlier that is the, still the counting machine behind every digital process promises an error-free product. But how exactly are we to meet the exactitude of the computer? Which I just want to clarify that it promises an error-free product. I don't think, I don't begin to believe it delivers an error-free product, but that's what the rhetoric is promising. So how exactly are we to meet the exactitude of the computer? By definition, any attempt to totally eradicate error or in, indeed domesticate it and render it somehow legitimate is missing the point. Not only will it transmute into the next new thing we don't want, but more importantly, the very value of error is its ability to interrupt and critically ambush the system from within. So on this side, via Selman's to fix an image in memory, and on the other side, uh, some of the 45 doors with their handles at eye level in Wittgenstein's house as a machine for counting in that populate the kind of ground floor of the house. But is counting safe, Wittgenstein asks. Yes, he answers himself. But only if the pieces don't change, if they don't change and we don't make some unintelligible mistake or a piece disappear or get added without our noticing it. Thank you. I sort of object to the idea that you said the DNA is like an architect who can't do anything. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, maybe architects aren't actually machines, uh, or uh, we are uh, definitely not precise. Mm -hmm. uh, could you expand on that a little bit, please? Can I expand on what? The DNA. The, the Sch Schrodinger, so Schrodinger sets up, uses the metaphor of the architect to set up this idea of DNA, to basically pursue his idea of negative entropy, um, and to effectively secure this extraordinary causal linearity, the idea that form is just kind of plowed through material, material can't interfere in any way, can't change in any way, um, and so on. And 
the architect serves as this kind of extraordinary metaphoric henchman that effectively silences all objection. This model endures to the point that Tony Vidler's convinced in the 1980s and people writing reviews of books on the Human Genome Project, i.e. very experienced molecular biologists, are still in 1992 somehow, even though they know better, sliding back into this narrative, sliding back to this kind of incredible metaphoric kind of highway infrastructure that um, Schrodinger sets up. And that's the point where Lewontin is saying, okay, let's just out it. These are all the things the gene can't do. Actually, it really can't do very much at all without the whole rest of the cell. And even then, there are serious limits. And what's extraordinary for architects is not to become amateur molecular biologists, although it's a, you know, it's a dangerous business. What's extraordinary for architects is what does that tell us about architecture? You know, what does that tell us? And what does that incredible inertia of that metaphoric infrastructure tell us about architects? Um, the end of your comment was that architects are not precise. Yes, architects are not precise. No, but, but, we, but architectural culture fetishizes precision, and most acutely in the mediation, the necessary mediation of representation, most acutely at that kind of anxious point of delegation, which is why Gordon Matter Clark is, remains so extraordinarily instructive because there, not only is there no drawing, although I know, I know he did his squiggles on cardboard and so on, but there's no drawing that's really, a, there's no delegation. There's no drawing about delegation, therefore there's no anxiety about precision. And we, we or there's no redundant precision, let's say. His, his work's extraordinarily precise, so in day's end he's hanging from a swing with a blowtorch with no harness, he's catching the house there in conical intercept, he's knocking out rubble and a giant bit, if you watch the films, that's meant to fall out onto the Trottoir de Paris, falls in and he has to, he literally leaps out of the way before it breaks his leg, you know, this is a kind of extraordinary, in a way that is an extraordinary true precision, there's no surplus precision there. Where does it lead us <laughs> with the artificial intelligence? You know, big computers, everybody's afraid of the big computers and all that, that we won't need people anymore doing anything. I don't know. But I mean, how far can you see uh, this danger that some people are saying that artificial intelligence will somehow, computers will take over? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about artificial intelligence. I can't, I really can't comment on that. Um, I can comment on where, um, an, where redundant precision is taking us with a, our current use of the computer as architects, um, if that's of interest to you. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, in a sense, the logical extrusion of um, Nancy Cartwright's critiques in History of Science, or Evelyn Fox Keller's critique in, um, in the Life Sciences, Nancy Cartwright is basically calling for more intelligent approximatory models. So more intelligent models that better mediate between the, the desires of the fundamental and the phenomenological, the kind of phenomena in front of us on the other hand. Now, the, the way we use the computer is we we, we kind of wade through the surplus precision without actually kind of critically interrogating it or without actually devising, whoops, devising more um, approxim model system of, of approximation that actually mediate between it and between material, between the exactitude of the computer and between our exactitude or between the necessary exactitude, the exactitude that's not kind of inutile, yeah? Um, Equally, Fox Keller is calling, and it's very much in a sense, it's the same call, but it's in different terms, for more equitable epistemologies, for, for more um, democratic ways of explaining things. So in a sense, those, I bring those up. It's a long answer to a question that I can't answer, which is it's, they're both calling for um, more critical thinking that better mediates between us and where AI could lead.
could you? That was fascinating, lovely Thank lecture. You, but Sandra. could you articulate uh, this connection between error and entropy? Because I'm, I'm, it was not clear to me. Because entropy is not really about errors. It's not that uh, error provoke entropy. I mean, it seems to separate two different things to me. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, it's interesting. There's there's a kind of intersection between error and the random. And obviously, the computer is a non-random environment. Um, and the computer has extraordinary ways of faking the random for us, um, conjuring up the random for us. Um, and then on the other hand, there's an intersection between error and the tendency to disorder, second law of thermodynamics, so entropy, in that the, in a sense, error can be understood, or physical manifestations of error can be understood as symptoms of entropy. You know, when when entropy is at work, what we perceive is the error. So, in in Aristotelian terms, he holds matter responsible for milk that turns sour, for the crossing of an ass and a uh, a donkey that produces a kind of sterile mule, uh, for healthy bodies that become rotting corpses. These are all also this is entropy at work. Um, so there is, I guess. The, I, I guess I'm really kind of setting it all up from from the Aristotle, as as um, from the from the kind of base point, um, from the relationship he's setting up between error and matter and this kind of entropic behaviour in matter, um, the tendency towards disorder and the metaphysics, yeah. But tell me, how are you thinking about entropy as being distinct from error? Um, I think um, entropy is like a, a change of state of, mm -hmm. uh, of matter, but it's not provoked by an error. It's like it, it, it happens. Mm -hmm. Like rotting bodies, exactly, it's mm -hmm. not an error. I mean, there is a process mm -hmm. that uh, provokes the decay and, and the rotting, but it's not an error. It's part yes. of it. Yes, right. Mm. So in that sense, it's about the tendency to get to a lower energy state, but on the outside of the rotting body, what we perceive is the erroneous, the erroneous behavior. Is things going wrong? Mm. Um, and I mean, error, error, I mean, I've worked on error for 10 years. I still don't, I feel like I don't know a thing about it. It's mm -hmm. this kind of extraordinarily evasive um, topic that kind of wiggles out of control the moment you feel like you've got a grasp on it. Yeah. Um, which okay. is true to character, true to definition. Many thanks. It was a very fascinating Thank <laughs> lecture you. and good speaker. Um, maybe this is a bit of a side uh, a question, but it comes from the set of images you, you showed us. You have been talking about this computer, we see this process, some of these images are strongly uh, related to the computer, the data, and then I notice very often that there is this, what I called, I mean, I couldn't find the right word, a kind of prosthetic. Here is the, the I mean, the, the, the hand that works, I mean, moves around. Just, I mean, my curiosity is, where is the body in this? <laughs> ambivalent world, the landscape. Where, where is the body in the iconography that was used to somehow explain the computer back to the intelligences that were living in bodies, in a sense? I mean, that's, that's what the IBM man and computer film is doing. And, and it explains the computer to us by like a doll's house putting little people in the computer yeah. that run around and do the things. You, um, and there's even, there's a further scene, there's so many exquisite scenes in that film, um, but there's a further scene when you're back outside the computer and um, the man walks into the room and hands to the woman sitting at the desk with a typewriter a program that she is then to type up. And, she, and he kind of sits on the desk while she's typing up, and he lights a cigarette, and he's smoking a cigarette, and she's kind of typing it up. And then when she's finished typing, she sits back, and he lights her cigarette, and it's this kind of post-coital cigarette. So, you know, where, where is the... Where, it's, I don't know where the body is, but it's, all, it's everywhere. It's all over. And the sky's pink, you know? I mean, what's, what's going on here? It's absolutely there. Yeah. Thank you.